We read scripture this evening from Matthew 12. We turn to Matthew 12. We read the first 21 verses in connection with our treatment of Lord's Day 38, which addresses the fourth commandment. Matthew 12. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. And he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep. Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a counsel against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he shall send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. We read God's word that far. May God bless his word to our hearts. As I stated, we have the teaching of Lord's Day 38. In the back of our Psalters on page 22, question and answer 103. Speaking concerning the fourth commandment, which reads, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. We read in question 103, What doth God require in the fourth commandment? First, that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained, and that I, especially on the Sabbath, that is, on the day of rest, diligently frequent the church of God, to hear his word, to use the sacraments, publicly to call upon the Lord, and contribute to the relief of the poor as becomes a Christian. Secondly, that all the days of my life I cease from my evil works and yield myself to the Lord, to work by His Holy Spirit in me, and thus begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. Beloved our Lord Jesus Christ, the violation of the Sabbath is assuming alarming proportions in our day. The Christian pilgrim, as he 
wanders and lives and travels through the midst of this world is increasingly threatened. The danger that he will defile his garments and adopt the habits of the world are great. And the prosperity that we enjoy today is not conducive to the spiritual keeping of the Lord's day. The temptation is to give ourselves to the things of this earth with the result that the Sabbath day is then violated. Home life quickly destroyed. And family fellowship becomes a strange thing because of the busyness of the pursuit of all of the things of this life. The things of this present life weigh us down. Heavenly things recede to the background. And instead of devoting then Sunday to worship, so tempting it is to devote it to the pursuit of our own pleasure, our own will, and our own ways. And in order to accommodate, churches are quick to change their services to Thursday night, to Friday, to Saturday, so that people can have the whole day of Sunday then to devote to their own pleasure and their own pursuit. Instead of working our schedule around God, we try to fit God into our schedule, just like we would fit Him in for piano lessons or for a dentist visit. With such a spirit of worldly-mindedness and materialism, the Sabbath then is set by the wayside. Our focus, however, is not on the world. We look at our own selves, our own walk, our own conduct. God ordained the Sabbath as a means for lifting us above all the busyness and all of the struggles of this life. Lifting us out of the things of this earth in order that we might spend a day contemplating spiritual things. God knows our weakness. He knows that we so easily press ourselves into the service of the things of this world We so quickly give ourselves to the service of mammon with the result that we become burdened down. God gives us the Sabbath as a day of rest, a day of relief, a day when we can turn our back on the covetousness, the materialism, the worldly-mindedness that so quickly plagues us, and we take this good gift of God and we press it into His service. Out of love for you and me, God gives us the Sabbath. And Jesus sets before us here in Matthew 12 the truth that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. The one who governs and dictates this day is not we, not what we want, not our desires. The Son of Man, He is Lord also of this day. And God sets before us a heavenly calling We who are so weak, we who are so sinful, we who fail in so many ways are given to understand what great things God has done for us. And God gives us to understand that we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom and that we are to set aside the Lord's day in the pursuit in a special way of those spiritual things with a view that this day become an occasion of oasis in the midst of the busyness of this life. And it become, as the Catechism says, that which is the beginning of our eternal Sabbath. We pray that God enable us to examine our own lives and to stand before His Word this evening. And we look at this commandment, keeping the Lord's day holy. Noting the idea, the manner of doing so, and the observance to which we are called. The central idea of the Sabbath is rest. This word means simply to cease or to rest. The idea is the same as the cessation of an earthly event, some event that comes to an end. God uses in the Old Testament Hebrew this word to refer to the day when manna quit coming down from heaven. God ceased that manna from coming down. Sabbath means to cease. And the idea, as we well know, is to lay aside our ordinary earthly activities and enter into the spiritual rest of God. We're familiar with Genesis. God created all things, and then He rested. God set aside the seventh day for divine worship in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. 
And the fourth commandment directs our attention to that required rest. We have Hebrews 4, verse 1, speaking of that glorious rest that God ordained for the people of God. And it's important that we know that that spiritual rest of the Sabbath is a creation ordinance. This harks back all the way to the beginning. It's not something that we can take or leave or determine whether or not it still applies today. God ordained the creation rest from the very beginning and then reiterated it when He gave the Ten Commandments on Sinai. Here in Matthew 12, Jesus identifies just two exceptions. Works of necessity, as He lays out with regard to the need to eat, and works of mercy, as He sets forth the healing that He was involved in. Now what's the significance of God's rest? The idea of God's rest is difficult for us to get our minds around. God cannot be idle. It's not the idea that God sits back and does nothing. God rested from all the work that He had made. And God's rest was an entering into the enjoyment of it. An acknowledgement of the glorious work that He had performed. The glorious creation that He had made. And the ability now to enter into the enjoyment of that work and to rejoice in it. God's rest was focused on praising and magnifying and exalting Himself for all the wonders that He had performed. God in His rest is busy. He's still upholding all things by the word of His power. As Hebrews 1 verse 3 points out, He's the one that's creating life, causing conception to take place. He's the one that continues that important work in the midst of creation, making sure that everything is sustained by the wonder of His providential care. If God would remove His hand from creation, everything would perish and fall apart. As repeatedly we find reference in the Psalms and other passages to that wonder. Now God's appointment of a day of rest was with a view to engaging us with Him in the consideration of His works. We're to set aside a day in order to magnify and to exalt God for all the works and wonders that He performed. Not just to praise the work of creation by which He created the whole of this world, but the wonder by which He recreated us in Jesus Christ and has given us to know the joy of redemption. We are able to keep that day in a way higher than Adam even. Adam was to look at the creation and rejoice in it. But Adam didn't yet know the wonder of deliverance and the wonder of the recreation that would be in Jesus Christ. He was given after the fall that promise. He viewed it in terms of the promise, but God now gives us to understand what great things our God has done for us and what great wonders He has performed. And we stand before all those works of God with awe. We delve into His promises and we're filled with thanksgiving and praise. What wondrous works God has performed for us, unworthy, sinful men and women. God didn't simply command men to take a holiday every seventh day as if God wanted men and women to relax. God gives us the evenings to sleep. God picked out a day the last day of the week throughout the old dispensation, and then in the new dispensation, the first day of the week. And he set that first day of the week as that week, as that day in which Christ fulfilled the law of the Sabbath. When Christ rose from the dead, Christ changed our worship from the last day to the first day. And he enabled us to understand and to know the true victory over sin and death. He did not remain in the grave, but He broke out of the grave as the one who had conquered death and the one through whom we are able to live. And God then gives to us that first day of the week as a day in which we are able to lay aside ordinary labor in order to contemplate on the wonder of that new life that is ours in Jesus Christ. A life that is from above. A life that is not merely living for the sake of the things of this earth. A life that already 
has that heavenly component as we are citizens of that glorious heavenly country. God requires of us then that in a special way we withdraw from the things of this earth that would burden us and take us down and we direct our full energy to God, the things of His kingdom and the wondrous glory that He has worked on our behalf. It's a day, beloved, that requires so much of me that I need to prepare for it. Many are inclined to make the six days of the week as long as they can, and then Sunday as short as possible. But the child of God sees Sunday as necessary, and as a pilgrim wandering through the midst of this life, recognizes the need for an entire day to devote to the things of God and the things of His kingdom. Our weekly Sabbath, as the Catechism points out, is a picture of eternal rest. We enter into that rest only through the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ. And we're freed from the bondage of sin. We're freed from the curse of the fall. Through Jesus Christ, the rest of God's covenant is perfected within us. We know that God is our God. And we know that He's with us. And He dwells with us. And He brings us into fellowship, communion with Himself. And we're able to enjoy the wondrous blessedness of that communion. The chief purpose of the Sabbath is not rest from our daily labor. Again, we can do that at night. The chief purpose is entering into the enjoyment of that covenant life that is ours with God in Jesus Christ. That rest is true rest. Entering into the enjoyment of what great things God has done and the wondrous joy of our salvation and the hope that is ours in Christ. Entering into the enjoyment of that glorious work of God so that we can praise Him, so that we can exalt His name. Engaging our minds then in activities that enable us to be reminded of that covenant fellowship that Jehovah God has established with us in Jesus Christ. And doing so in a manner more fully than we're able to do throughout the course of the week. We spend our time in devotions. We open the Word. We pray through the course of the week. But then God gives us the oasis of the Lord's Day. A day in which we can gather with our fellow saints. We can hear the glorious message of the Gospel. We're able to spend time in the Word, time in prayer with our families, encouraging one another in the Lord. And there's a flowing over then of the Sabbath into the whole rest of our week, as the Catechism again beautifully points out. Jehovah God creating a continual cycle in our lives so that the whole of our lives are constantly pointing us ahead to that glorious rest that is in heavenly bliss with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we work in the midst of this world and as we give ourselves to our labor, we become burdened. We're caught up with all the cares, all the concerns of this life. Jehovah God directs us to the things of glory. He lifts us. We don't work for the weekend. We don't work for our own pleasure. We work with a view to that glorious rest that God has given us in Jesus Christ. And after a day of labor, we look forward to, we long for that fellowship, that communion with God, that refreshing grace by which we can again be strengthened and equipped for the life that God calls us to live. We're guided more and more to heaven. God is reminding us as we go through this life, you're pilgrims, you're strangers. I have something far more glorious in store for you. And He's directing us through the Lord's Day to the pursuit of the things that are eternal. We can't avoid the Lord's Day. The more and more result that God works within us is that God works a longing. And as He works in us sanctification, and as we grow in our understanding of the things of God's kingdom and the glorious works of God, He works in us a longing more and more for not only the first day of the week, but for the eternal rest that will be ours in glory. Now, no other commandment is as controversial among Christians as this commandment. None of us 
would approve serving idols or not honoring our parents. We would not favor telling lies. We recognize it's wrong to lie. It's wrong to break vows that you've made. We're united in our opposition against stealing, against murder. And again, we go through those commandments and we recognize how they convict us in the heart. But we don't think much about using the Sabbath for our own pleasure, for our own enjoyment. And so easily we can approach this day then in an entirely wrong way, with the wrong questions, with the wrong perspective. We want to know what we can do before we even ask, why do we have the Sabbath? What's the importance of it? What's its place? Our desire so often is just give me a list of do's and don'ts, I'll paste them on the refrigerator, and now I can go forward. And now we're able to keep the Lord's Day holy. That misses the entire approach of the Lord's Day, and it misses the purpose for which God gave us this day. We need the Sabbath day. Even though so often we don't think we have time for it. We're so busy, we don't have time to set aside our labors entirely for an entire day. The Sabbath, beloved, was not given to restrict us. It was not given by Christ to burden us. Jehovah God, in His sovereign love for us, gives us the Sabbath for our own well-being, our own good. And God, in His sovereignty, ordains our work week. Six days shalt thou labor. That's God's sovereign ordaining. Ordaining also then one day for worship. Jehovah God, who made this world and everything that is therein, says, your work is important. Your work is essential to your existence. For six days. To deny the importance of your work for those six days, or to be lazy, is a sin against God. But Jehovah God is also sovereign with regard to that rest. He teaches. There are works of necessity. There are some works of mercy that are necessary to be pursued on the Lord's day. But in the big picture of things, you're not working one day a week is not going to affect your business. It's not going to bring down your ability to care for and provide for your family. Your farm, your business is not going to fall apart because you're keeping one day for the Lord and you're not engaged in work on that day. Isn't it our nature? We become so proud that we think that we need to be busy and we need to continue to go because apart from us, everything is going to fall apart. We're necessary. We're absolutely instrumental in everything that's going on in our life. Jehovah God is sovereign, and in His sovereignty says, six days shalt thou labor. And the other day is to be devoted to rest. And we pause and we rest, confessing that Jehovah God is faithful, that He will sustain our lives, He will provide for our needs, and He will grant us what we stand in need of as we, in obedience to Him, submit to His will. How do we do that? How do we keep the Lord's Day? We celebrate the first day of the week as the Sabbath. God and His counsel set different phases of the weekly Sabbath throughout history as God developed His covenant. And it's important that we look at that. The Seventh-day Adventist, besides committing a very serious error in that they hold the works of a woman, Ellen White, in higher regard than the special revelation of Scripture. Therefore, the fundamental problem with the Seventh-day Adventist is not their failure to worship on the first day of the week. Their fundamental failure is that they believe in the continuing of special revelation. They insist that in the new dispensation, we still celebrate the Sabbath as God instituted. But they do so on the basis of more than just Scripture. And for that, we of necessity must condemn them. But it's important that we understand as well, why is it that we worship on the first day of the week? Why is it that that changed from the Old Testament? We can distinguish the work of God throughout history 
regarding the Sabbath into a number of stages of development. There's the creation Sabbath. Then there's the shadow Sabbath, which was Canaan, a picture. And then there's the resurrection Sabbath. And then there's the final Sabbath that we look forward to in glory. First of all, there's the Sabbath of creation. God finished the work of creating the heavens and the earth on the seventh day. He ceased. And He entered into rest. Now that's a revelation of God in time. Within God's eternal counsel, all of His works are one. We recognize that God's creation work and God's resting, all of that is identical as pertains to God's eternal counsel. But in time, God created all things in six literal days. And then He entered into rest on the seventh. The fourth commandment, as it's set forth in Deuteronomy and Exodus, emphasizes that truth as it makes comparison to our work week. We are to work for six days and rest the seventh, just as God created it in six days and rested the seventh. It's important for those of you who engage in in polemics against creation, those who would hold to a long period of time, that we bring the fourth commandment to bear on the matter. The fourth commandment is clear. It identifies the days of creation as the same as our work days. And it's one of the best ways in which we can demonstrate to others the fact that when God is talking in Genesis 1 about a day limited by evening and morning, it's the same day as we have today. As God says, work six days and then rest the seven. In the first paradise, it was His calling to labor to enter into that rest. And God created Adam and Eve as His friend servants in order to enjoy that glorious rest with God. They did so. They did so by keeping the garden, laboring in obedience, maintaining the covenant of God, all according to the wonder of God's grace. But as Adam labored and as he was busy in that work, he never entered into the rest of God. He was not able to enter into the fullness of that rest. He violated the covenant. He profaned and denied his sovereign friend and as such then became an enemy of God. God had spoken of His rest to man, and man despised that rest. God therefore cast man out of His presence. But the Sabbath had something better for us. And God then gives the promise concerning Christ and the seed of the woman. And God establishes according to Hebrews 11 verse 40, that which would be better. The creation Sabbath passed. Seemingly lost forever. But God saying, I've ordained something better, something higher for my people that will be through Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, he began to realize that higher manifestation of his covenant to bring us into a rest even more glorious than anything that Adam and Eve could have enjoyed. Leading his children to cease from their daily toil, from the slavery of sin, and giving us to understand deliverance from corruption and deliverance from the darkness and bondage of death. God working in us to perfect that liberty, that freedom that is in Jesus Christ. And secondly, he gave then Canaan as a picture of that. What was lost with regard to paradise, God now gives a promise with regard to Canaan and the glorious place that Canaan would occupy for the people of God. The heart of life in Canaan had to do with the tabernacle, the temple, fellowship with God. This was where God dwelt. This is where the people of God would enjoy communion and fellowship with the living God. And so Canaan was a Sabbath land. It was a land where the people enjoyed not just the weekly Sabbaths, but then the Sabbaths of the festivals, the special years, every 7th as well as every 49th. The weekly Sabbath, a memorial to Israel to remember the great deliverance of God when God had delivered them out of bondage, out of Egypt, and brought them into the joy and the delight and the rest of the glorious Canaan. We read in Deuteronomy 5, verse 15, and remember, 
that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Yet God's work wasn't finished. That was just a picture again. That opens the way to the third of these developments. God spoke of a different day when His rest would be realized through the blood of the Lamb. And God worked to realize that day in Jesus Christ, accomplishing it when He sent Jesus into the flesh as a man. God dwelling with man as Emmanuel in covenant fellowship. Jesus Christ laboring and toiling in order that He might open that way of rest for Himself and for all those whom God had given to Him. He suffered. He fought alone. He shed His blood and He died and He entered into the agony of hell for the sake of realizing that glorious rest. And at the end of His perfect obedience, at the end of the perfect work that He had come to accomplish, He realized that rest. He was raised from the dead and He entered into heavenly glory. The Sabbath of the Lord, therefore, was realized on that first day of the week when He broke out of the grave and when He demonstrated that victorious resurrection life. Through the resurrection, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ proclaims with might and power, it is finished. The work has been accomplished. Everything that was required with regard to salvation is done. And what we could never do has been accomplished then by our Savior and by our Lord. The battle over sin and death is over. Rest from your labor. Rest from your toil. And find that rest in me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, said Jesus. Psalm 118 was a prediction of that glorious rest that would be accomplished at the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Psalm 118 talks about the stone that the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus was the headstone of that corner in the day of His resurrection. And that day became the day then that Jesus Christ consecrated. He made holy. The psalmist says, we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. This is the Lord's day. And into this rest, we now enter by faith. God gives us the gift of faith, and we lay hold on Christ, and we confess. Through Him, we are able to know that rest, that glorious rest that we could never attain to, that we could never earn, which He earned for us. And we experience rest then from sin, from unrighteousness, from the burden of that sin, the guilt and the shame of it. And we enter into the joy of that life that is in Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in Him. But even now, we yet live in the midst of this life. There's still struggles. There's still trials. We experience hardship. And even now, the Sabbath is not fully manifest. That fellowship and communion with God in Jesus Christ, we have it. We have it in principle. And yet, the fullness of it has not yet been realized because we still do battle against sin and temptation. Those sinful natures are still with us. And therefore, finally, we look forward yet to a more glorious rest. We look forward to the fullness of that rest as God will establish it in the new heavenly Jerusalem where God will dwell with men in that perfection of His tabernacle. And when Christ comes again, He will make our bodies like unto His most glorious body. And He will establish that heavenly, glorious tabernacle of God with man. Then the work of God completed. And we entering into the fullness of that glorious rest with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the perfect activity of praising God and glorifying Him from hearts no longer 
burdened and tainted with sin, but now able to praise and to magnify Him in perfection. How do we observe then this day? The first paradise will never come back. And we don't want the first paradise back. The Sabbath of shadows in Canaan was only temporary, as is true of all the shadows. The earthly land of Canaan has been forever destroyed to open the way for the saints to look to the heavenly Canaan. A better day has dawned. And it's this message that we bring to the Seventh-day Adventists and to others. They ignore that. They don't see it. A better day has dawned on the first day of the week in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as He accomplished for us a rest that is sure and true. On the first day of the week, the glorified Lord entering into the fullness of that rest and bestowing that rest upon His church and giving us to know that we are the temple of God with men, the Spirit living and dwelling within us. And on the first day of the week then, God's people gather together on the Sabbath in order to celebrate the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who has opened the way to rest, and the one who has given us to know the joy and hope of our salvation. The observance of the Sabbath, then, beloved, is not something that can be legislated by the world. It's a blessing at times for Christians to live in communities where there are so-called blue laws, restricting business on Sunday, making it so that we don't have to worry about our employers requiring of us that we come to work on the Lord's Day. And we Christians then can enjoy a greater measure of peace, and for that we're thankful. But the ungodly cannot celebrate the Sabbath, even if they would refrain from all work. The Sabbath is spiritual, and it's only possible by faith. God works that faith within us by which we lay hold on Christ and the rest that is found in Him. And our keeping of the Lord's Day, then, is an expression of faith. It's an expression of hope on the part of the child of God who's laboring in the midst of this world knowing I am a pilgrim, I am a stranger, and God has given me a glorious rest that now I know in part, but I long for the fullness of the enjoyment of it in glory. The child of God then, already now, has the beginning of that resurrection life. We cease from our labor, we rest, and we are given to know Christ and the wonder of what He's done for us. We're new creatures in Christ. We're citizens of a heavenly country, a new Jerusalem. And we therefore, beloved, come to church as the apostles came to the tomb on that resurrection morning with joy, rejoicing. After a week of struggle, a week filled with stress, we come burdened at times. But we don't come sleepy, tired, grudgingly. We come burdened but we come with joy, thankful that God has given unto us the opportunity to come up to His house and to show forth His praise. And we work hard to come with a right spirit and a right attitude. And the only way to come is by faith. And that requires of us preparation. It requires of us that we think on spiritual things. It requires of us that we stand before the wonder of God's works and we stand in awe of God's wonders. And our desire is to grow in our love for our God. That our families more and more increase in their appreciation for what great things God has done for us. And so, on the Lord's Day, in a special way, we spend time in the Word. We spend time reading, preparing for Bible study, taking up our memory for school, working on our catechism, as parents, we teach our children to enjoy and to anticipate the Lord's Day, teaching them the need for that spiritual rest, their own sinfulness and the burdens and the significance of this day in light of what Christ has done for us, teaching them their sinfulness, the wonder of God's grace, the fact that the harder we work, we can't accomplish anything, we can't 
labor in order to enter that rest, but Christ has done it for us. And through him, we have been gifted with this glorious rest that is in the enjoyment of the salvation that God has given us in Christ. We teach them then the only way of rest is through Christ, delighting in God's will, pursuing His glory and His honor. Anything else is bondage, guilt. When we treat the worship of God as a low priority, attending when we feel like it or sleeping through the worship service when we do come, taking opportunity to use the Lord's Day to attend sporting events or sitting in front of the television all day, What's revealed about our spiritual condition? What does that say about us? Are we living as pilgrims and strangers? Do we love Christ? Are we seeking His well-being? Do we desire the glory that awaits? What kind of a message are we sending to our friends, to our family? By God's grace, we join in worship in order to show forth to our covenant God the love that we have for Him. Rejoicing in the opportunity to meet with Him and to show our thanks to Him for the great blessings He's bestowed upon us. So that the ministry of the Word and the schools must be maintained according to the Catechism. The schools, primarily there, are a reference to the theological schools that prepare ministers so that we can have the lively preaching of God's Word that drives us to Christ every Lord's Day. Apart from the preaching that would direct us to Christ, there would be no rest. But we need, be, we need to be directed to Him and to the glory and the wonder of the Gospel. The Christian day schools can be included especially in terms of preparing men and preparing the saints for the spiritual sensitivity to listen to the Word and to apply ourselves to the pursuit of God's kingdom and the things of God's kingdom. Where there is no preaching, difficult it is for us to experience that rest. But beloved, in the way of prayer, and in the way of seeking God's will, we come into His presence. And we begin every week in communion with our Heavenly Father, counting it a joy to come up to His house, to be reminded of what great things He's done for us, worshiping Him, glorifying Him, praising Him, for the wondrous work that He has performed for us. And in this way, as the Catechism again points out, there's a sanctifying influence on the whole of our week. As God realigns our priorities, reminds us of the greatness of His grace, stirs us up to greater thankfulness in order that we might abound in His service, seeking the glory and honor of His name. Negatively, then, we cease from our earthly labors. But we do so just for one reason. So that we can have more time to devote to God and to devote to Him more fully. Deeds of mercy and deeds of necessity must still be done, as Matthew 12 points out. But even in them, we seek to glorify God. And we need to be convinced in our hearts where there is much necessity required of us yet on the Lord's day that we are in a vocation where we believe God has given us the gifts and a way in which we're able to please Him. And we don't use those works of necessity as an excuse to treat the Lord's Day like any other day. We don't take extra shifts. We don't take on more work on the Lord's Day. Lucrative sometimes the pay can be. But we only do that which is required of us. As soon as that work stands between us our ability to enter into the rest of God, then we need to give up that job. We need to find something else that does not stand in the way. Because our whole spiritual life is going to be adversely affected by our continued disobedience. We cease from our earthly labor so that we can have more time, more room to pursue the things that are heavenly and spiritual. And we seek to make the same possible for our servants, for those who are required to work for us, making sure that they too are able to have time to devote to the things of God's kingdom. We lay aside then everything that would be for our own promotion. And we devote ourselves to the spiritual activities for God's sake and for His glory. 
The question always we ask is a positive question. Will this help me enter into the spiritual rest of God? Will this activity remind me more fully of the joy of my salvation? Am I doing this for God or am I doing this for myself? And Sabbath observance, it's important for us to understand, is not such a subjective thing as many try to make it. Saying, oh, he keeps the Sabbath on the lake. He keeps the Sabbath while he's walking in the woods. He keeps the Sabbath while he's playing ball. He keeps the Sabbath while he's working. He keeps the Sabbath while he's going out to eat. No, the Word gives us clear guidelines. And the clear guideline is this. Everything I do on this, the day that God has given me, must help me enter into that spiritual rest and cause me to grow in the joy of my salvation. And so I ask myself, do I need to travel on the Lord's day? Or am I doing this so that I can selfishly enjoy my Saturday on vacation or not miss a Monday of work? Whose day is being sacrificed, mine or the Lord's? And with respect to every aspect of the day, the question is, am I giving the Lord priority? Am I seeking the things of His kingdom? Is this a means by which I can grow closer in my walk with Him in covenant fellowship? And everything else... I seek to lay aside. Much, much is made sometimes of my liberty to do this or my freedom to do that. As we become more sensitive to the Lord's Day and its purpose and significance and benefit in our lives, the more we're going to realize that whole matter of liberty begins to fall away. I'll realize increasingly that what I thought was liberty and what I was trying to excuse was really selfish. It was sinful. Liberty is found in serving God selflessly. And beloved, as we do so, the Lord's Day has then a heavenly influence on the whole of my life. I don't view the Lord's Day as bondage. I don't view it as restricting me. We've been delivered from the law of sin and bondage. We now walk in the liberty that is ours in Jesus Christ. And that liberty is walking in the knowledge of the greatness of His grace and His goodness toward us. We don't allow ourselves to fall back into bondage, to spend the Lord's day in front of the television, sleeping the entire day, is to return back to the way of bondage. To involve ourselves in our own pleasure on the day is to involve ourselves in bondage. In those ways, we're never going to experience rest, our lives are just going to be filled with more pressure, more stress, more guilt, more difficulties. But beloved, we drink of the spiritual fellowship, communion with Jehovah God. And as we drink of communion with the living God, we are refreshed and we are energized and we desire to live for Him. We spend Saturday evening at home preparing for the Lord's Day, doing so by prayer, knowing how sinful I am and how difficult it is for me at times to look forward to the Lord's Day. Prayer for myself, my family, prayer for my pastor, prayer for the other members of the congregation so that we gather in true worship and thankfulness. Prayer for grace and strength to enter into the enjoyment of that rest and to hear the glorious message of the Gospel. And then we spend the Lord's Day with the Lord. Worshiping Him with His saints. Reading the Scriptures. Reading good literature. Giving ourselves to the pursuit of the things of His kingdom. Going over our catechism with our children. Working with them with the worksheets. Telling them the stories. Thrilling it is to see parents involved in the lessons with their children. Not only making sure that they knew their questions, but also going over that, explaining it to them. So that they come to catechism and they say, you know what this means? This is what it means. My dad told me. Looking over their written work before they hand it in. Some mistakes they make are so basic. Sometimes they forget to fill in certain blanks and I have to mark it wrong. Look it over. Sing with your children. Spend time. Make Sunday a special day. A day that's not a burden. A day of delight. A day of thanksgiving. A day that is set apart from the rest. A day when we are able to do things ordinarily we don't have the time to do. We can go to the nursing home. We can visit our elderly saints. We can visit others. We're able to spend time with family and friends. 
And the day doesn't end until the Sabbath is over, as we encourage one another in the Lord. And even when the day is over then, as the Catechism says, it's going to spill over in the rest of the week. I'm going to face Monday with a different perspective. And I'm going to be engaged in my work in a different way. I'm not laboring for the things here below. My desire is not to remain here forever. God has given to me a glorious rest that's in Christ Jesus. And it's for that rest that I long and I seek after. And God works patience, contentment, peace, as I live for and long for that glory that awaits. Beloved, the Sabbath necessary as preparation for our life in heaven. Heaven is not going to be a place of laziness, of idleness. Heaven's not going to be a place where we selfishly pursue our own pleasure, as so often the world talks about. Heaven is a place of perfect rest and communion with the living God. Now we don't know the details. So much is hidden from us. But we do know the glory of heaven is such that we cannot even begin to fathom it with our finite minds. That which we experience now is merely a foretaste of the glory that awaits. And God brings us now into fellowship with Him and communion with Him and the enjoyment of our salvation and the peace that passes all understanding in order to prepare us for the joy, the true joy that awaits. And through that means, He quickens our spiritual life. He makes us strengthened in our hope and in our joy. This, beloved, is the way of sanctification. Resisting the temptation of the flesh, resisting the way of the world, clinging to Christ, Lord of the Sabbath, and viewing the Sabbath as an oasis for which our soul longs. Not a burden, a delight, a privilege. Beloved, the Sabbath must be about Christ. About our covenant fellowship with Him. About the wonders that He's performed for us. The glorious rest that He has earned on our behalf. Laying hold on His promises. Seeking His glory. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, strengthen and equip us for the work to which Thou dost call us in the midst of this life. Thou dost call us to work, and Thou dost call us to rest. And we thank Thee that that rest is able to serve our labor as it prepares and equips us to understand and to see that all things are for Christ and for His glory. And grant, Lord, that we might be forgiven of our sinfulness and our selfishness, the pursuit of the things of this world, and grant that we might, as Christians, show our love for Thee, our delight in the things of Thy kingdom, and that we might long for that eternal rest that awaits. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen.